Okay, so first and foremost, uh, let's get some clarity around uh, fish. What actually is the fish? Because uh, this is one of the key things to understand. And of course, there, if you go to internet and you browse for what is what a fish is, you'll get plenty of answers. And uh, let's say every opinionated person in the startup world has their own definition. Out of all that I've seen, the one that I like the most um, is the definition that comes from Chris Berry, one of my prior investors and mentors. And he says it's a way to get your fundamentals across. So this is your way to communicate the scope of your business, like everything you've been working on for the last six months or longer, in four minutes, in that particular case. So this is your, your window of communication. It's, a not, it's not a natural form. It's not a presentation of the project that you are used to at the university. It's the way to plant an idea of how the business, how this business works, what it's all about, like from zero to painting the picture in the time that is given. So it's also important to understand what pitch is not. So first of all, is my company. Ah, here it is. So pitch is not about your technology. Like I know you are mostly technical students, which means you know a lot about programming, but that's not what we want to hear about. Like I don't want you to talk about the technology that you have used to build that. That's not something that uh, your audience in this in this particular case investors will care about. It's also not a time to brag about your academic background. Um, there is uh, a nice saying about that that I've actually encountered in the first person that helps me to remember um, about that. Um, once when I was walking through UC Berkeley, I realized that there are parking spots at the university campus and are reserved only for Nobel Prize of, uh, laureates or winners. So that means that you can only park at this spot if you have a Nobel Prize. So if your team consists of people who have Nobel Prize, then yes, go and brag about it. If not, it's good to be humble with that because people don't really care that much about your academic background. Because again, the best entrepreneurs out there usually don't even didn't even finish the university. Like if you think of Mark Zuckerberg, he was a college dropout. If you think of Steve, Steve Jobs, he was a college dropout. Uh, if you think of uh, Bill Gates, also a college dropout. Like all of those guys, they even did not finish universities and they built companies that has a significant uh, impact on the reality. So a pitch is not the time to brag about uh, to brag about your academic background. There is a slide about the team, and we'll discuss it later, what should be there, but it's not about, it's not the opportunity to present your resume. Also, it's not about your elegant code, it's not about your beautiful UI. So, one of the key problems with entrepreneurs is that usually, especially after you've been working on your project for such a long time, you kind of feel that your project is your baby and you really want to, uh, to, share the, to share the story how great your product is. This is not what Pitch is about. Pitch is about selling the concept of your entire business and the product that this business is, uh, has developed and is serving is only one part of it. It's not the whole picture. That's why you need to make sure not to get too far when, when talking about the product. Because the thing in here is that a pitch is an artificial form of communication from you as an entrepreneur to an investor so that you can present him with an opportunity. So that he can understand why this is an interesting business, why this has a chance to succeed, and that he thinks that it's interesting enough so that it makes sense to work on that purpose. Because uh, the uh, oh, I missed my steps. Okay. Um, so before I'll get to what I want to say, let's uh, quickly make sure that we have the language uh, done right. 
So a small addition to the first lecture when we were talking about startup language. Mm. There is a couple of terms that I that I will be using and I'm using on this lecture all uh, the time, and I want to make sure you understand the difference correctly. So there is a pitch, and the pitch or the elevator pitch that you've been working on is the thing that you say. So this is the the presentation, not the slides. It's how you deliver it. It's what you say. Then you have a pitch deck which is the set of slides that you use to support yourself uh, while doing this. So a pitch deck is not a standalone set of slides that you can send to someone, for example, to present uh, your business. It doesn't tell the whole story. It is just there to support you when you are talking so that you can make more impact on the audience. Then, you have something that is often called a teaser. Teaser is a form of a pitch deck that is meant to be sent before the presentation. Because in the regular world, it's not that easy that you will just get investors knocking on your door and saying like, ah, would you mind telling us about your startup? That's not how this works. Usually it's actually you who need to go out to people and say like, look, I am working on this interesting project and I would like to pitch to you. And the typical answer you'll get, especially in Poland, is like, would you mind sending me a teaser so I could see what it's all about? So a teaser is a small, like it's a version of pitch deck that is a standalone version that tells the story all by itself. Meaning that you can, uh, that somebody can understand this business just from reading the teaser. And just to make a few teaser is not something that I require you to do as a part of this project. But I think it's important for you to understand the difference between the two. Because many of you, while working on slides, you will have this problem that you will try to achieve both uh, objectives. So having a nice pitch deck that will help you communicate your points across, and at the same time, having a nice standalone document that you can use to actually show someone your business without you standing in front of them and pitching. So this, generally, this is not possible, and ju you just need to keep those two separate. They might be similar, but this is not the same document. And then, the thing that probably helped me want most of the funding I have uh, even ever received is actually a follow-up deck. So this is a third deck. This is a deck that is more extensive than the teaser uh, that I use to send after the pitch to investors that kind of, that the, in the moment when they already know what this business is all about, they know me, they know uh, how passionate I am about this project, they just get more information so that uh, you know all the people that will be working on like evaluating whether it makes sense to go forward with this or not, just have them more material to work on. And instead of taking their information from Google um, and some random source I have no control over, they will take more information about the business, the industry, uh, from myself. So this is the, uh, the trio of different slide decks that uh, I always have. There are, again, some of the slides are similar, but those, are, those have uh, three different purposes. So again, pitch deck supports your pitch as a background. Teaser is something you have to send to anyone to get an opportunity to pitch. And then follow-up deck is something you send after the pitch to investors to make sure that the conversation is going and to have even a reason to contact them after a second. Ah, here it is, because I thought you might need more information on my project. And yet again, teaser and follow-up deck are not required for grading. I'm just giving you this so that you understand what can help you with fundraising, what is the like, proper way of doing that, or state-of-art way of doing that. Mm, getting back to the, uh, to what pitch is. Uh, sorry for this small confusion. So, this is the ultimate objective of pitch, pitch you're giving. You only want to hear from investors that they want to learn more. You don't want to communicate them the entire business, your entire business plan, your entire go-to-market strategy, all the details about your product, your market size, and there's no way you could do that in four minutes. Like, that's not possible. So, you just want 
to make those people interested enough so that they say that they want to know more. You want to get your fundamentals across. You want them to make sure they understand what, what is actually the problem you're solving. Like the most common pitfall I have seen in, start, in startup pitches that I have seen is actually the fact that those startups went so quickly through what is the problem they're solving uh, to like what is market, uh, how we're going to counter it, that half of the audience was not aware what are they actually doing, like what is the thing they're doing. And that is the most critical thing. Like if there is one thing you should be focused on while doing this, is to make sure that everyone in the audience after your presentation will be able to tell what those guys are doing. And this is not trivial, so keep that in mind, that once you get your fundamentals across, you just want investors to make you curious. You want, it's again one of the things that I've heard multiple times towards me, and I think uh, this is pretty true, is that when it comes to investors, you don't need to get them to say yes. You just need to remove all the reasons to say no. Like, investors have money to spend, it's their job. Like, that's what they are required to do. So you just need to make sure that you will remove the reasons why they could say no. And that's what you're doing in the pitch. Like, if in the pitch you will uh, get them interested, they won't see anything that they consider like an uh, like immediate blocker and say, no, there's no way this could work or I don't know, there's no way this team could pull it off, or I see they're unreasonable with how much money they're asking at the stage they're in, or whatever it is. Like, you just want to not to fall in any of those uh, pitfalls, and then you can move on. So, actually thinking like a VC is one of the best things you can do while creating your pitch. This is the first um, of a couple techniques that I'm going to uh, sell you today. Of course, it's difficult if you've never worked as a VC, if you don't know any VC. Still, I suggest you go Google, see some interviews with the VCs, and try to understand how they work. Like, what is their objective? Because they will be looking at it through their lenses. And their lenses usually are, we have raised a pile of cash from some investors. Because, just to make it Clear VCs are usually not spending their own money. They're spending someone else's money. So they are um, intermediary in here. Their goal is to find the right projects to invest. So they have money to spend and they have to spend it. Like once you will get over like initial hurdles, you will you will often learn that investors sometimes want to give you money when you don't need it, because they need to spend it. Like they need to spend it in certain time frame. So that's, uh, I, I encourage you to try to get into their brain and then think like, okay, so what, what a VC or what an investor would think if I would tell them that, well, in Poland alone, the market for this is X. Like, what would be their way of thinking? Would they think that, okay, the Polish market is good enough or interesting enough for this? Or would they think that, ah, that means that the person that is saying that is thinking only in like a perspective of Poland and is not thinking wider. Like those <coughs> are the things you need to ask yourself. It's like how this information that you are delivering to your audience, to your to investors that are listening to you, will resonate with them. And of course, it's not easy if you have no experience with that to uh, to foresee all the consequences or all the possible thoughts a VC might have in mind. But it's important to understand that. Like I remember I was talking with one of the teams uh, here that starts their elevator pitch with a metaphor that using their product could uh, save you um, a money that is an equivalent of a, a ticket to a concert. And they actually pitched, uh, picked an artist that for most of the VCs, which are usually old white men, uh, would mean nothing. Like this is uh, more of a, uh, this is an artist of your generation, not necessarily their generation. So the entire wave of the metaphor that this is something very cool to have uh, will not go across. So again, think about it. Like think about who your audience is, 
um, in general, and in this particular case too. I've sent you LinkedIn profiles of the investors that will be there. Go and look at them. Like, see where they, you know, what is their background? Uh, are they technical or not really? Look at uh, where they're from. Like in, those, in these, this case, both are Polish, so that's, uh, that limits the thing. But usually, you might end up with investors coming from different countries, having different backgrounds. And it's important to tailor the pitch to your audience, because this increases your chances. Because while pitching, you will hear way more no's than yeses. On average, you will hear one yes on 19 no's. So that means you will deliver your pitch 20 times, and only one you will, you will hear, okay, I want to go forward with, those, with this conversation. So you need to increase your chances by getting into VC's brain, trying to look at your pitch from their perspective. The other important technique that might be helpful while creating pitch is understanding how system one and system two of thinking works. This is one of the concepts in psychology that is very helpful in, uh, in pitches. And what is the difference between system one and system two? System one is the uh, type of reasoning where you can almost automatically create an answer, which is like the common, uh, common, um, uh, common idea here is like, if, you, if I ask you how much is two times two, you don't really think about it, you just know the answer. Like it's, it's, it obviously, it's obviously displayed in your brain even before you start thinking about it. But then if I ask you, um, you know, how much it is 25 times 25, probably most of you, it will take a while for you to actually figure the answer. You actually need to start thinking about this. Do you see the difference? And that's exactly what you need to think of while creating your pitch. Meaning you want to tell your pitch in a way that it does not activate system two. That it goes suddenly on system one, which means it's very natural. You tell things that you hear and you kind of nod your head and say like, yes, this is obvious, this, this is like the very natural consequence of the fact that they have brought earlier. It's, there is a natural flow. Every time you break the flow of the presentation, every time you omit certain step in your reasoning, or you make a, an assumption that is obvious for you but not obvious for the investor, you actually require them to activate their system two of things. Like they start to think, and the moment you let them think using system two, there is a risk that they will start disagreeing with you. Like they will start thinking like, okay, this is not right. So while, think, while creating your pitch, and then while listening to uh, the way you deliver a pitch, look for things that are not going smoothly, things that are not smoothed out, so that there, is, there are some holes in it that you need to bridge to understand the pitch in full. So the more natural, the more smooth the presentation will be, the better for you guys, so keep that in mind. And the more system one it is, the better it is for you. Okay, the next uh, couple more technical things around your presentation. So first of all, there is a famous uh, 30, 20, 10 rule uh, that has been created by Guy Kawasaki, uh, one of the uh, executives at Apple years ago. <laughs> and it says that you cannot use a font that is smaller than 30 points on your slides. So nothing smaller than 30 points. That the pitch should last 20 minutes and it should have 10 slides, like pitch deck. Of course it has been created in 2005, and nowadays where nobody is able to stand 20 minute pitch, so that's why we're down to four. But the two other parts still apply. I don't want to see any slide or any number on your slide, anything on your slide that is smaller than 30 points. And this also applies to charts, this applies to sources of your data if you want to quote them on the slide. There is nothing that is smaller than 30 points. And this is still a lighter version because the more uh, rigorous version in Silicon Valley says that you should pick the age of the oldest person in the room and double it by two. So, or multiply it, sorry, by two. Um, so 30 is not that bad. <coughs> then 
don't put too much text on your slides. Three to four bullets per slide, five words in each bullet, that's the maximum of text you may put on your slide. Again, those slides are not to communicate the entire uh, vision on their own, they are here to support, support you present. Huge visuals, charts, graphs, pictures, everything that helps to get your message across. For example, when I was delivering my uh, last version of pitch, I was starting by like a minute story of one of my customers. And the only thing I had on the slide was a photo of this customer so that everyone in the room uh, could visualize this person. So it was easier for them to understand how this small business owner uh, <coughs> looks like. So visuals are useful. Of course, there are some, I would say, worn out uh, visuals. Like when you do a comparison, a competition comparison chart, and you always put yourself in like upper right corner of the slide because uh, you have like everything that is needed and all other companies are missing everything. And I would say VCs are joking about this one, saying like, ah, this is so obvious, but on the other hand, it works. Like if, if this is a good comparison and this match pattern that you have created like makes sense, mm, then, then that works. So yeah, visuals are good even if they are worked out. And then build your slides. Um, you will be presenting with your own device, so you can test it multiple times. Uh, I already know that some of you have access to this room, so you may learn from where is magic. You know how to get to this room, don't you? Yeah. So, you know where to find him if you don't know how to get access to this room, and you can ask him what is his trick. Uh, and do come here and see how the slides work on this particular equipment so that you don't have any problems. And because you are using your own equipment, you, may, you can make sure there are no surprises. So you can use site builds and introduce your points one by one. Because otherwise, there is a, imagine I just displayed all of that for you at once. You would all start reading this, and for the first five to 10 seconds, it doesn't matter what I would be saying, you would still be reading this, not listening to me. You don't want this to happen to you when you deliver your pitch. That's why you build your slides and introduce it point by point. With this said, there's one important thing about video. Some of you might have an idea that you want to include videos in your presentations. I would say I'm not banning that. Yeah, you can do it if you really want to, but I don't encourage that because I've seen video uh, failed on presentations like so many times, usually the critical moments, that this is usually not worth uh, the, the time. But if you really want to, if you really feel this is the only way to get your message across, then definitely test it earlier, make sure that you know how to get the voice across, that, the, that it looks good on this screen and that it, that it delivers the message you want to deliver, because videos are tricky. Like I see them more often broken than working properly when I see other startup uh, pitch. Storytelling. This is the final and the most powerful technique you may use. Remember, VCs, investors, they see thousands of presentations every single year. Um, it's boring, really. Like, to be very honest, I'm not a, if I'm on a pitching content, there's 20 presentations before me, I can barely stand watching those 20 presentations before me, no matter how interested in starting. Um, and investors are the same way too. So it's their job to watch those pitches, but if you make it more interesting, more entertaining in a sense, if you make it more real, you will stand out from this crowd. That's why uh, I would bring that with you guys when you decided to do uh, to center your story around us. My told you like you need a story around it because this makes your story more powerful. Like there's a huge difference between uh, well we just thought asthma is an important problem to solve and well I had my little brother and I've seen him struggling with uh, his asthma inhaler for years and I thought that there must be a better way and that is why we're here today. Like there is a huge difference between the two. 
And if you look deep into your motivation, like why you are solving this particular problem, there is usually a story behind it. Like there might, those might be different types of stories, but a story you can tell, especially if you introduce the concept, also shows your passion, shows your commitment, shows that you, you really care about this. And this is also important because investors know that there will be hard times in your startups. There will, be things, there will be moments when you will be running out of money, then the traction will not be there, you will be selling your product less, uh, like not as quickly as you hoped for, and there, you will be in doubt. So the more motivated you are, the stronger your motivation is, the more you will be pushing forwards no matter those obstacles. And that's what your investor wants, obviously, because once they invest money in you, they have no other way to influence that, so they need to bet on your um, desire to go forward no matter what. So that is why I do encourage you to uh, to bring, to introduce, or to make certain part of your presentation. Of course, if you uh, feel there is a place for it, like I don't, it, it is not like neither of those techniques are like required element that you have to put all of that in your slide. But keep those in mind because they, they might help you to create better presentations. Okay, let's get to the actual pitch deck. Because as I told you uh, before, and as I've written the email, I want you to have an exact set of slides, no exceptions. So the first slide uh, goes with logo, tagline, and vision. That's where you say we are um, Tinder for activities or Airbnb for uh, cars. Like this is the moment when you give your name, you give your logo if you have one, and this is the moment when you briefly explain what it is. This is the moment when somebody should be able to like at least associate from like all possible types of business, okay, these people are solving the problem of the food waste, or these people are solving the problem of this or of that, like, so that they are able to pin you to a certain part of the universe. Then the next slide is about the problem. This is the moment when you need to tell how big this problem is, how big and unsolved this is. This is the most crucial part. Then, naturally afterwards, uh, there is a solution, so you tell how you are fixing this, how you are changing that. And those two, you kind of already have in your uh, elevator pitch, so you just need to slightly extend that uh, as you have a little bit more time than in the elevator pitch. Then the mark. This is where you actually put all the information, maybe not all, you select some of the information that you've been working on uh, when you were doing market sizing and understanding the, um, the, understanding the market here. And by the way, this is an important note. You should know more than you are delivering on the four minute pitch, because there might be questions. People might be interested to follow up on certain things. So it's good if you have some additional information you can share the moment they ask you a question. So you shouldn't put all the things you know on the slide. You should put whatever, 30% of you know on the slide tops so that you have, uh, you have some backup in case it's needed. So that's the market, uh, the market slide. And again, pick the information you put on each of those slides carefully. Like always think, why do I want to say this, not that? And how would a VC think about seeing this instead of saying that? Because probably the problem you will have is that you have too much to put on your slides and too little. Then the business model. Uh, again, we've been working on the business model, so you know where, what to put in here. It's an information how you are, how this is going to work from a business perspective. Like we know that you are solving the problem of the food waste, but how exactly? Like okay, I know we've enough, but how this works? Like what is the way you are making money on this? Um, then go to market. This is uh, also pretty important for you guys especially. Uh, again, we've been working on what the go-to-market is, but the question that investors will have particularly towards you is like, okay, how a bunch of students will be, like how a bunch of students will be able to pull uh, it up? 
And this is important so that you can show that we actually know how to make this happen. <coughs> that we have thought about it and we have an idea how to do it. We're not going to put our app on the App Store or in Google Play and hoping for the best. Like, there is a plan there. Then competition. Again, this shows that you have done your homework. And I don't want any team in this room to say that they don't have a competition. Like this is the biggest mistake you can make, single biggest mistake you can make doing this. Like every single one of you have a competition of sort. Even if you are entering new market, people have been solving this problem that you are aiming to solve in a different way. So it's okay to say that, well, we are creating a new market here, but looking at how people have been solving this until now, you can say that, well, our competitors are this, this, and that. Like, you need to give your competitors, and actually having competitors is not bad. Like, many people think that if I have competitors, or if there are people in this market, then that means that it makes no sense uh, for me to be in the market. No, actually having competitors validates your market. Like it proves that the market is real. Because one of the questions that investors are asking themselves is like, okay, is this a true market? Like, is this really a thing? And if you are able to point to some well-founded competitors, you can show like, well, look, there is this company in the US, there is this company in China. They've raised millions of dollars and they're doing great. That shows that there is something in it. So on the contrary, if you are if you don't tell that your customers are that your sorry that your competitor is not going well, because the question that will again come to investors' head is like, okay, so is this a problem of this industry? Is this not a good business, or is it just the problem of this company that wasn't able to uh, to operate? Like, is it the execution problem, or is it just a bad business? You don't want this to happen. But of course. Once you have a competition, you need to be able to differentiate yourself. So about half of the uh, 20 seconds that you have for the competition is talking about how you are different from the competition. Like you need to, depending on what, where you are uh, with your story, you need to position yourself and like, okay, those are the traditional alter alternatives, but they are lacking this crucial ingredient to solve this problem. So people are using this because there's no better way, but people will jump to my solution momentarily the moment it's out there because it is so good, because it addresses the central problem <coughs> that is not being addressed by the traditional solution. Okay, traction or validation. This is the one that you might have the biggest problem with because as far as I know, none of you is actually selling your product or accepting pre-orders or anything to like show that there is a real interest for that. So you will need to be creative here. You will probably need to show the extent of your customer discovery because this is probably the best way you can do it. You can use things like a quote from a customer that, uh, that seems very powerful to you. You can use um, things like numbers of people you have spoken with, like things that shows how far down the road are you. Mm. Again, in the later stages, that will be where you will be showing your sales numbers, the development of your project if you're in pre-release stage. Like this is a thing. But by the way, I know that some of you are actually building your projects. If that's the case, this is the moment to brag about it. Like to say that we are almost there with, uh, with it or we're going to release it in Q1 or whatever is the phrase. Like as I said before, I do not require you to build those projects, but if you have decided to build it anyway, uh, then good for you. This is the moment to brag, because again, this shows something. Like this shows that it's not only a project on paper, there is more into it. Like there is some technology that has already been created. Mm. Okay, next one. Then team. Team is an extremely important slide. And with you having little to no professional experience, it may be difficult for you uh, to shine on this slide. But you still need to show that you have a team that is complete of 
that is complete and that is able to make this happen. So you can go back to the week one, to the roles that we have, and what you want to tell your investors is to show them that, um, yes, we are four computer science majors, but we actually have what it takes to make that happen. Like we have this, this, and this. We also know that we are lacking this and this. That's why we have looked for outside advisors, for example. If you have any advisors, then it's a great idea to put them on those slides with their name, with their photo, uh, alongside with your names and your photos, so that you can show that actually, you know, there is someone out there that actually thinks it's a good idea. And that's someone with like years of professional experience in that. Mm, other things that might be helpful in uh, on the team slide is to um, is to admit that you are good at this, this, and that, but there are certain things that you are lacking. At this stage of project, it's okay that you don't have everything solved. Like there might be parts that you are not sure about, and it's actually even, I would say it's sometimes better to have a known weak spot that an investor can easily spot, and then you can say like, yes, I'm aware that we're very bad at engineering and we'll need some external help there, but that's exactly why I can reach out to you, their investor, because I know you have a very good track record of uh, bringing good CTOs on board and we'll need your help with that because we are good at marketing, but we suck at engineering. Or the other way around. Uh, it's okay if you are not, like if you don't, if you're not complete, like it's too early, uh, it's an early stage. And investors also look for places they could create value. Because especially here in Poland, but also most in most European countries, uh, investors think in a way they want to be the smart money. They don't only want to give you money and hope for the best, you also want to feel that they've actually helped you in a certain way. So that is why if you show them a certain weak spot that they can feel, it's, it's helpful. Like this is, it actually can increase your chances instead of decreasing them. And it also makes you more real. Like people don't want artificial salespeople that will come and deliver something that like, that is not believable. Like they want to make sure that this <coughs> that you're in this, that you really want to do it, and that you have what it takes, with the exception of this one thing that you're missing. Ask. This is the last and final slide. This is a slide where you say what you actually want from the people you're pitching. This might be money, if you are looking for investment at that time. So it may go as like, right now, we are looking for a pre-seed investment of whatever, 200,000 US dollars. Um, and we want to use this investment to launch our beta version, do more customer discovery, and get to the first paying customer or first 1,000 paying customers, depending on what is your business model, what are you doing to yourself. That might be one way of doing that. The other way of doing that is that you may not ask for money. You may ask for advisors, mentorship, and, uh, or for example, key hires. So the ask may go like, I'm looking for connections to, let's say doctors treating asthma. Meaning I'm not looking for money right now. I know it's not, it's not the moment where I want money. It's for example, too early or it's sometimes in between the rounds. So like, okay, I'm, I, I have cash right now. I don't need to raise money, but I'm looking for contacts. I'm looking for connections. I'm looking for advisors that can bridge this gap or that can uh, introduce us to certain people. Like um, the, we have the startup in the room that is helping electric car, car owners to, um, let's say, charge uh, their cars easier or with less queues. Um, and again, the, the ask for that team might look like, okay, we need to get in touch with more electric car owners because we want to verify uh, what we're thinking. Like, it's absolutely okay if you ask for money. Like, feel free to do it. If you, if you think that this is what your startup needs right now, go for it. If you think there are other things that you could, that could benefit you more, then uh, do it. Like, it's up to you, you may choose it. Um, all in all, 
this presentation needs to be believable. Like it needs to get your fundamental across. It needs to make and it needs to make an impression of you and your team that you know what you are doing, that you still have some challenges in front of you, some unknown unknowns that you will have to deal with, but you're passionate about it, and there is no obvious reason to say no in that case. Like again, for it's it's all about making sure that you won't say anything that will ultimately make this like not a good investment. If you get to that point after those four minutes, you've been successful. And last but not least, practice. To be very honest, it takes me around 15 to 20 times uh, to actually master my pitch. And I'm saying about things after the slides are done. Like the moment I have my pitch deck ready and it's ready to support me, it's for me it's between 15 and 20 times before I'm fluent enough with my pitch so that I could deliver it in a professional way. Um, that was one of the other reasons why I decided to go for such a short form, so that repeating it all and all and over again uh, won't take you too much time. But I do encourage you to do that. I do encourage you to do it in your team, within your team. If you can get to any pitching event and do it in front of some other people to test it beforehand, go ahead and do it. If not, uh, learn how you can get to this room and try to do it here so you get um, used to the room and you feel how to do it. And practice, practice, practice. I'll actually try to uh, arrange my travel for the next lecture in such a way that I'll be here one day before. So if any of you would be interested in uh, doing a test run with me beforehand, I'll give you a chance to do it. I cannot guarantee that right now, but I'm working on that. So um, if the chance will come up, I will, uh, I will let you know uh, over email. Mm. It's also important for each team to decide who is going to present. Because only one person from the team will be actually delivering the pitch. I want all of you to stand here and support the person, but it's only one person who is actually going to speak. So pick this person wisely, and there are multiple things to consider while doing that. It, the obvious way of going there is like, let's pick a hustler, because if you remember the week one uh, way of dividing people, like if you have someone who is who is easy to talk, it's, it's easy for them to present. That, that's like a one typical school, like you just pick a hustler. But this has some risks involved, because as hustlers we tend to talk too much, and we tend to like, be pretty flappy in the sense like, we could talk about nothing for uh, any amount of time. Mm. So some, and it, sometimes we look too slick, too gimmicky, not really authentic. <laughs> so it's not always the best idea to pick actually a hustler to do that. Um, the it might be a way for you, but I I'm, I'm, I say give it some more thought before you decide this is the person that is going to do that. Uh, the other trick uh, is, and I'm sorry for calling it a trick, but it, we're talking about presentation technique here, is to uh, pick person that is not a typical starter just to underline your diversity. So if you have a woman in the team, uh, giving her a chance to present, or agreeing that it'll be, uh, it'll be a girl that's presenting, can, again, boost your chances, cause I think like 96% of all startup funds go to male-founded male startups, and people are aware of that and they want to change it. So there is, like if you, and it, it just makes you stand out. Like again, after we'll have 14 pitches here. So the <coughs> if you like playing the diversity factor card is helpful because at least it gives you an initial attention. Of course, it can't <coughs> win you any punch. Like let's be clear about it. But it gives you this. Ah, oh, okay, someone different this time. Okay, and then of course it's up to you what will happen after you start pitching. If the pitch will be terrible, it won't help you. But it gives you this small boost of attention at the very beginning. Um, 
the other idea might be to actually uh, get a foreigner to present. Because again, it shows that your team actually has foreigners on the team, which means you are not that Poland-centric about this. Um, this, again, might help you. Um, I'm not saying, again, none of those are fair requirements. This is just things that you may want to consider while thinking of who should do that. But at the very end, you just may want to meet in your team, let everyone deliver the pitch, and see who comes as the most natural and the most passionate.